so we can make sure we have that recorded. Awesome. All right, everyone. So it is two o'clock on the dot. Good evening to you all. Um, I am LaShawn Gordon. I get the privilege of being the Director of Membership and Engagement at United Partners of Human Services. Um, we also have my colleague and our executive director, Amber Tynan on the line. She's not on camera, but she is present. Um, and today we are talking about the homelessness system of care. Very excited to have our partners, the Big Ben Continuum of Care, facilitating this training today. Also, uh, Taylor, who we know has worked in the homelessness community for several years. Uh, we do have a full agenda. If you have a question or something comes up, please put that in the chat. Me and Amber will be monitoring the chat, um, but we're not going to prolong any longer. I did want to acknowledge Mayor John Daly, who is on the call with us today. So thank you very, very much, Mayor, for being here. And Miss Amanda, I'll turn it over to you. Let's get going. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Amanda Wander. And I'm the executive director at the Big Ben Continuum of Care. And those of you, I recognize lots of people, but I see a few new faces too. So those of you who aren't familiar with the Big Ben Continuum of Care, um, we cover an eight county area and the Big Bend area, including Leon County and city of Tallahassee. And we try to help communities plan to address homelessness and um, homelessness and come up with housing solutions that are gonna meet people's needs that we see through the homeless system of care. Um, we also do a lot of uh, data collection, data analysis and needs assessment and planning with each of those communities in our coverage area. And what we hope you get out of this session today is um, that you understand what seems to be a mystery behind um, navigating the homeless system of care. Um, you need to know this because you may run into somebody who needs some help, needs some, some direction as to where to go to get the resources they need. Yes. And so if you understand where to send them and um, the different partners that are involved, that means they don't have to spend quite as long trying to navigate their own way to the resources. So we all play a role in that. We all um, can help somebody by you know, loaning them our phone to make a phone call to an agency. Um, what have you. So um, our homeless system of care has grown, you know, each year we've added a little bit more to it and more services. And so we'll go over the major components that should be part of a homeless system of care. And the um, sections and components we're going to go over today are all parts of our continuum our continue of care here locally. Um, I'm going to share a resource with you guys and um, LaShawn will be plopping some uh, links in the chat so you can follow along and play along with these different visual aids if you want to. Um, the first one, I'll actually share my screen with you guys. Um, this will help me explain kind of the different components of our system, but it'll also give you something to reference as well. And it gives you a lot of details. So if you're thinking about being a provider of services, this is one of the first things you need to reference to understand the different types of services that you could offer and what are some of the regulations around that with the funding that comes through us through the HUD and through HUD in the state. Um, let's see. Can you all see that okay or should I make it larger? That looks great. Okay, um, we'll go with this. So um, this is actually updated to include some of the components of care that have been rolled out because of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so this is super up to date, but it is interactive and it complains or it uh, explains, not complains, um, explains some of the major components of a homeless system of care and when each part or that component comes into play. Um, so we'll kind of go through that now. So up here, we have the inflow of people who need services or they're nearing a housing crisis in the midst of a housing crisis or actually considered literally homeless and either sleeping outside or in their car, something like that. 
So at that point, when someone finds themselves in one of those situations, the first thing they should do is access um, one of our providers who offers prevention assistance. And so prevention, homeless prevention in this case, um, is a measure that's taken before things are catastrophic and before you really have a housing crisis. So prevention interventions include things like um, past due rent or past due utilities. And these types of interventions are designed to keep the person in the housing that they're in now. And if it's not affordable any longer, prevention can also be used to help relocate them into something more affordable and more sustainable long term. Um, but it's really important that this type of intervention come in at the right time. So if it's, you know, if somebody already has an eviction notice and they're evicted, um, this may not be the proper time to do this. Um, as much notice as possible. Uh, if you're having trouble or you know somebody who's having trouble making payments on their rent or mortgage, um, we need to know as soon as possible. Our major providers that offer prevention locally are the Big Bend Homeless Coalition and Catholic Charities. Um, they both run financial programs that provide financial assistance for past due rent and utilities. Um, and one of the common um, misunderstandings is that prevention and diversion are the same thing. They're not. Um, they're both kind of designed to keep people out of the homeless system of care, but diversion happens immediately before somebody attempts to enter emergency shelter. Diversion, what we're trying to do through diversion is divert people from entering emergency shelter. So what happens in diversion programs, which um, the Kearney Center just got funded from the state to operate a pretty large diversion program to help keep people in the rural counties, in their counties, so that they're not coming to the city of Tallahassee and Leon County to get services, get um, housing. Um, it's better if they stay in their community where their supports are. Um, but the things that are negotiated through a diversion program are things like, you know, what would it take for you to be able to stay one more night um, at this location? Um, do you have any friends or family that you can stay with a couple more nights? So these are more short term immediate solutions that really include a great deal of mediation and negotiation skills. Um, and sometimes when folks come to us, you know, they're really freaking out about where they're going to spend that night and they may not be thinking through all of the resources that they have and the social supports they have. So the diversion programs are really designed to have some one on one interaction with somebody to see what they can pull on as existing resources so that they don't have to come into emergency shelter. Um, in our Family Shelter, Hope Emergency Shelter for Families, they also do that um, as a part of their operations so that they can get people in safe locations because they don't have enough space to just continually take any family that comes forward. Um, so that's kind of how that's managed is getting people into other locations that are safe, staying with family temporarily until something opens up um, more long-term for them. Um, the major entry points into our system of care include emergency shelter and outreach. So a lot of times when, um, you know, we talk about homelessness, the, the first and sometimes the only solution that people know about is homeless shelters. And um, that really is just one component of the care that we have to offer and manage through our, our system of care. So, um, because of COVID, we've had two types of emergency shelter uh, pop up. So we have congregate shelter where we have, you know, a bunch of people staying in one location, um, which is traditionally what people think of as emergency shelter. And then now because of the pandemic, we also have non-congregate emergency shelter, which means that people either stay in a hotel or an apartment or something that's more of like an individual unit or a shared unit with fewer people so that, um, there's a, a greater safety put in place with the spread of COVID-19. Um, 
at these points, when somebody comes into shelter um, or are connected through outreach, if they're sleeping outside, maybe they're sleeping downtown or um, in an encampment, we have outreach workers through Ability First and some other partners that go out and meet the person where they're at. And so at that point, that outreach worker can direct them to emergency shelter. They can also help them complete some of the um, kind of pre-screenings to see what they might need help with. Um, but these are the major entry points into our system um, through emergency shelter and through outreach. Um, when somebody kind of is identified through outreach or by coming into an emergency shelter, within the first 14 days or so of staying at an emergency shelter here locally, we have our emergency shelter staff administer the coordinated entry assessment. And what this assessment does is it kind of assesses um, what the person's history has been and what they may need to get out of this instance of homelessness. So Jonna uh, Coleman, our coordinated entry director will explain that more in depth um, in the next segment. But um, that is what it's designed to do is to prioritize people based on their vulnerability to get them into and refer to interventions that are gonna help solve their housing crisis. Um, it is, a change in the way we think about uh, providing services. So the coordinated entry project is not meant to be a wait list. It's not meant to be based on first come first serve for services. It's based on vulnerability and how likely that person is to die if they continue to experience homelessness. So this is a hard concept to grasp um, because it is kind of like a dynamic wait list. Um, so just because you came in on a wait list before somebody else doesn't mean that you're gonna get housing placement before somebody else. It really depends on who all the other people in our system are and what challenges they have and how vulnerable they are. So um, we're constantly kind of assessing that every time a new person is added to our coordinated entry system to make sure that we are always um, placing services and housing options for the people who need it most and have the least amount of supports and are the most vulnerable. From that point, after we've conducted that assessment, um, we're able to kind of see what type of housing intervention is gonna be best for that person and likely what they'll benefit most from and not return to homelessness. So some of those inter interventions can include permanent supportive housing, so that includes, um, you know, maybe somebody's put up in an apartment or an individual unit. They also get pretty intensive case management and connection to any other services that they may need. These projects are targeted for people who have long histories of homelessness and disabilities. So um, this is for a very specific population and it's um, inclusive, inclusive of wraparound services um, per the client's readiness to kind of engage in that. Um, we also have access to rapid rehousing. So rapid rehousing assistance is very similar to homeless prevention and what it can provide. It can provide rental assistance and utility assistance and case management, but it's designed to get people from homelessness into housing of their own. So um, it can't really pay arrears so much, but it can pay you know, your, your first and last month's rent or first and second month's rents, depending on which funding stream it's coming from. Um, we have a lot of resources for rapid rehousing right now in our community because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Um, we also have transitional housing. And um, so we have a few different projects that you guys are probably familiar with that end up housing some of the folks that come into our system of care, but it's a transitional program. It's not forever. The client doesn't necessarily have a lease of their own, so it's not permanent, but it can be housing that's provided between, you know, six to 24 months. Um, usually there are program fees um, and requirements for participation in that program. An example of a transitional program would be, um, Care Tallahassee, 
Um, they house men straight out of um, prison or jail. Uh, Mercy House is also another example. Um, and it's real important that we have all of these components as part of our system of care, because you guys know how we are all different from each other. What suits me is not gonna suit somebody else. Um, and depending on what's going on and how vulnerable they are, um, this may be too much support. So permanent supportive housing is not, we may be spending too much resources on one person if we offer everybody this. But if we offer everybody rapid rehousing, maybe they're not getting the support they need that comes with permanent supportive housing. So it's real important that we have a menu of options that people can kind of choose from and uh, fit in based on their need. Um, we also need and have affordable housing. Um, and this is an area where we absolutely need more, but this is just mainstream housing with housing subsidies. A lot of times people don't need case management, people don't need any sort of financial assistance except for affordable rent. Um, and when I say affordable rent, I mean affordable on a super low income. So a lot of the people who come to our system of care find themselves bringing in less than $1,000 a month. So you can imagine most of our single bedroom um, occupancy apartments here are around 700, 750. And so if that's what they're bringing in a month, 750, they don't have um, funds for food, utilities, and other basic needs like co-pays, that kind of stuff for medications. Um, so subsidies through programs like Section 8, that kind of stuff is kind of what can keep somebody in housing long term. Um, if they're you know, never going to earn enough to be able to afford that on their own, or never going to be able to work enough hours to do that. Um, and then we kind of, from that point, people leave our system. From each of those independent programs types, they, they leave the system and exit onto permanent housing. And we try to do everything possible to keep people stable once they leave the system. But if they happen to um, fall on hard times again, then, they would attempt to first use prevention resources um, or diversion uh, so that they don't have to enter this system of care again. Um, but those are kind of the major components of the system of care. Another big component of the system of care, um, you know, we have prevention, outreach, diversion, emergency shelter, Coordinated entry is a huge component of our system of care. We have transitional housing, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, and affordable housing. But at any point, any of these interventions can also include mainstream support services. And we do that through partnerships with providers like Appalachia or TMH. Um, if there's something that a client needs at any point, wherever they come into the system, to, that's going to help uh, their situation and help them achieve their housing goals, we can kind of link them up with those services immediately to keep them uh, stable. And they're linked with things that are mainstream in the community that they have access to after they leave the homeless system of care. That's incredibly important. Um, if we set up kind of an insular system where they can only get what they need within the system of care, then they're not going to be able to thrive on their own once they leave that system of care. So those mainstream supports are incredibly important. And um, one common mainstream support that we don't often think about are faith communities. So um, there's a tremendous amount of support and family available through faith communities. And a lot of times people need help kind of setting up their social network again. Um, and that is ultimately what keeps them from entering homelessness the next time uh, because they have a support system to walk through some of their choices with. So they don't have to hit that diversion point and have to talk to somebody they don't know very well about it. Um, but if, if they don't have those supports, that's when they end up coming to, to our system of care. Um, that's kind of a brief overview of the different components of care. Um, we'll have a poll question for you. 
And then um, Jonna Coleman, our coordinated entry director, is going to walk you through more of the details about how somebody gets access to coordinated entry and then what that means for them um, and how they get connected with housing options and programs. LaShawn, are you able to get the poll going? Oh, you're on mute. You can actually click on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys, we're, um, we're having um, learning experiences all together. Amanda, I can take this one. Okay, oh, thank you. you. Got it, actually. Or somebody did. <laughs> All right, so this is a question just to see if you guys um, kind of got the, the big points. Um, but when a person comes into emergency shelter, they should be assessed through what system to determine what housing intervention would suit them best and referred to appropriate programs. All right, looks like we got some smart people. You guys paid attention. <laughs> Can you guys see the results on your end or when I hit the end poll, will that present the results? End poll. All right. All right, so you guys were correct. Um, C, coordinated entry system um, is the correct answer to this. Um, that is what tells us what somebody needs and how to pair them with the best suited intervention for them. Um, I'd like to, LaShawn, should we open it up for questions now or just keep going? Yeah, I think that was three mouthfuls. So yes, if anybody <laughs> has any questions, I think now's a good time before we move into the next segment. It looks like there's a question from David in the chat. It says, is there a list of all the options for each of the boxes represented in the inflow slide prior to the CES? Um, so actually what we're working on right now is the same type of interface and interactive link from our website so that you can click on each of those types of interventions, whether it be emergency shelter, outreach, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, and you can see all the providers of that service in our community. Um, we don't have that available in that format for you right now. We do have a services guide that lists everything that is offered by each agency on our website, but it's ever changing. So we need a way to manage it that's a bit more dynamic and easier to update. Um, so that'll be coming to you soon. And looks like David, so Pam says, what would be the process? Would the process be the same for counties outside of Leon? Is there any point, to, any point of contact in other counties? Yeah, so where we're at right now with other counties, we have some of the major service providers that cover the other counties that do coordinated entry. And so, they, you know, that person can call that agency and a lot of it can be done over the phone. What we're lacking is access points within each of the rural communities. So we need more partners to agree to administer the coordinated entry assessment and to agree to be an access point to make sure that we're fully connecting with all of our coverage area. Um, so that is an area where, you know, maybe you, you and your connections can kind of help us expand it in a community. And I see Graciela had a question that she wanted to ask. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm sorry if I am asking uh, something that it was said. I, I am having a hard time um, hearing the, uh, the, the YouTube video at the same time that, um, you know, all this and I need to concentrate on one thing. Anyways, um, so as an agency, uh, so we, if we have anyone that uh, you, that we need, um, that this person, this client needs your services, 
uh, will you will you be do uh, do we do a referral or we just uh, you know ask them to call you or or how does that work? So actually, that'll be the part that John is going to share with you. Um, we oh, have okay. providers that specialize in different groups of people and are trained to interact and um, serve youth versus uh, families, individuals. So we'll kind of give you some direction about which place you should send clients to to be assessed. Um, and then our office, the Big Ben Continuum of Care office is always an option too. So if you're just not quite sure where to send somebody, but you know they need services through some of the homeless service providers or they're nearing a housing crisis, you can contact us and that information will be shared with you um, in the HMIS presentation too. Okay, thank you. Sure. So we're gonna take one more question and then I promise we'll come back to the questions. Um, but the next question is, can you keep a living document in Google Docs with all invited, um, invited to an organic permanent changes as they're made? not oh you mean the the interactive document yes i think that's what deanne is asking okay um that is something we can definitely look at doing um it seems as though some of our consumers need an actual printed thing um to to take with them um but a lot of the agencies who are helping people <laughs> something that's a bit more immediate and maybe web-based um, so we just have to think about uh, all of the needs for the people who need the information and make sure that we're doing the best job of keeping it up to date and disseminate in the community. But I like that idea um, of a Google Docs. Become an access part. All right, Amanda, if we want to move to the next section, we'll come back to some of the questions. Sure. Jana, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Can you, can, or good afternoon. I'm still in morning. Um, good afternoon. Um, so I like to think of coordinated entry basically uh, as kind of like a triage. So if someone were in the emergency room, um, we're going to take the people who are the most um, acute first. Um, so with our system, um, we want to take the people who are the sickest, the oldest, usually um, who have the longest history of homelessness. Um, we're going to take those people into account um, before we would um, work with someone who may be um, just entering homelessness. Um, so our um, system is kind of set up that way. So we have moved from a system where people are um, being served as first come, first served, um, more to a prioritization um, a kind of, of structure. Um, so we actually have a video. Amanda, do you still have access? Can you play the um, coordinate injury um, video? And I think this will give you guys um, um, just a, a, a basic view of how coordinated injury um, is set up and how it should run. And then I'll come back and give you guys a couple of more um, specifics about where to send clients and um, about the assessments and things like that. Single parents, children, veterans. Can you guys hear that, John? No. I can't hear you, Jonna. I was saying, can you cut it up a little bit? Oh, okay, it's coming through though.
<clears throat> yeah, so Amanda, real quick, um, some people are asking me and um, it's the same for me, it's a little muffled. So I don't know um, if, if you, when you share it, if you can share it with the volume as well, because it sounds like it's coming through your speakers and we're hearing it that way versus We actually have this um, linked on our website, so you guys can view it at any point. We'll just kind of skip the rest of the video and um, have Jonna go through it. And I'll drop um, the video link in the chat so you can kind of reference back to it and know where to find it. It's in there. Thank you. Um, so um, the video was just stating that um, we work through coordinated entry, as Amanda stated. Um, if someone were to enter into our coordinated entry system, um, right now we do have um, access points. Our family access point is um, the Hope Community um, Emergency Shelter, our single site um, for uh, individuals um, or individuals without children is uh, the Carney Center or CESC. Uh, emergency or non-congregate uh, shelter right now. And then we have our youth shelter uh, is led by um, CCYS and Ability First would handle all of our, um, anyone who had a mental health or a physical disability um, would go through um, Ability First. And then anyone else that you guys are unsure of, um, the Big Ben COC, our, our staff is able to um, kind of help get those people either assessed um, or hooked up with the team um, or get them through. Um, am I on mute? It's telling me I'm, I'm on mute. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, Jonna, do you mind sharing the documents that show where these places are and um, the phone numbers and stuff? Sure. And as she's sharing everyone, there will be several links in the chat. So feel free to copy those links. You guys give me just one second. John, are you having trouble accessing it? Um, um, okay, um, I'll take over with the. Maybe um, coming up. Okay. Yeah, I'll I take still over with um, the um, uh, links, but you got to follow the agenda so I can keep up. Um, so I don't necessarily. Do you do you have that pulled up? The two the two pager. I apologize, you guys. Yeah, we're actually having some technical difficulties. It won't let me access it, but I do have it already pulled up, I think. Um, hang on one second.
Okay, it should be up, Jana. Okay. Um, so as you see, um, CCYS Going Places Drop-In Center um, is located on Dunn Street, um, and that is in the Frenchtown area. Um, and you can see their assessment hours. Um, this is a drop-in center, um, and it is run. Um, there'll be uh, street advocates there. Um, I think they're in the process of, of restaffing, um, so you can definitely give them, give us a call, and we can get you connected with um, a street outreach advocate um, who will um, be able to visit your youth. Uh, the Kearney Center Emergency Shelter for Individuals um, would be the um, access point for someone um, who was an individual, an adult um, who was over the age of 18 um, without any children present. Um, they would go to uh, the Kearney Center to be assessed. Um, they are currently working a little differently um, as they are non-congregate now. Um, again, you definitely welcome to give the COC a call and we'd be able to get you in touch um, with someone who um, could, could see you from the Kearney Center. Hope Community is our access point for families. Um, I believe their times are still um, pretty, um, they're, they're accessing their time. Um, if anyone needs um, to get into either the individual or the family shelters right now, they are um, having a wait list. Um, so once someone was enrolled in either the Kearney Center or Hope Community, all of those clients are assigned a case manager um, and they would begin to work through the coordinated entry process um, so that they would be able to um, access housing opportunities. Um, again, Ability First is for anyone who may have a physical uh, disability or any mental health issues. Um, they would be able to work through Ability First. Um, they, Ability First also has a street outreach program um, that is dedicated to working with people um, in the city of Tallahassee who are um, unsheltered um, and they do um, do coordinated entry assessments on the streets um, as they meet people, um, as well as um, our other large outreach team is uh, Bill, um, Big Ben Homeless Coalition. Um, and they will, um, their AVH program, which is Supportive Services for Veterans Families, they also um, conduct assessments for both veterans um, and um, will refer the non-veterans to uh, one of the other outreach programs. Um, so that is the way um, that you would access the, the system. Um, again, as stated, the system is for people who are uh, literally homeless and who are looking for uh, housing opportunities. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the assessment um, that is completed um, without, with our coordinated entry system. The first thing that someone would do is to do a pre-screening and the pre-screening is done within the first 14 days that someone um, has accessed the system. After those 14 days, they would complete a, um, a VI spadat. Um, so this is a um, assessment that kind of looks over um, someone's vulnerability and assesses that by scores. Um, the the ISPDAC comes in three forms. So there's the VISPDAC 2.0 that we use. Um, and that VISPDAC is for singles. Um, we have a family VISPDAC as well as a transitioning age youth VISPDAC that is for um, individuals who are 18 to 24, um, who may be enrolled in a youth program. Um, if someone, once someone completes their VI SPDAT, they are given a score um, and that score will tell us whether or not that person is um, going to most likely benefit from permanent supportive housing, um, if they can uh, benefit from rapid rehousing or if they um, don't need any housing for intervention and could, um, thank you, Amanda, and could, uh, you know, basically just self-resolve on their own, you know, given the, given the time. Um, so as you see on your um, screen, um, the, the scores that are given from the VI SPDAT, um, so zero to three um, is for no intervention. And for those people, they usually just need some mild case management. Um, just a little bit of time maybe to get their life back on track and they're able to uh, self-resolve and to move into permanent housing on their own. 
um, the middle scores, which is usually somewhere between a four and a seven, um, those clients will likely be referred to a rapid rehousing program. Those may be people who are able to work. Um, they uh, may have, you know, had some history of homelessness, but it is not extensive um, and require very minimal case management intervention. Um, people who score eight above or for families a nine or above are people who we would look at for more uh, permanent housing and supportive housing uh, interventions. So these may be people who will need um, our permanent supportive housing that is um, uh, set in place by HUD, um, or maybe they will need a Section 8 voucher um, or some other long-term subsidy, as well as intensive case management in, a, in order to sustain uh, permanent housing. Um, the assessment actually is broken down into um, five categories. One of those categories is history of homelessness. So it looks very closely at someone's history of homelessness, um, the length of time that they've been homeless, where they're living. Um, all of these are taken into account for those scores. Um, the next section is risk. So um, under risk, we kind of look at um, examine how someone has interacted with our crisis intervention services. Um, so we're looking at their um, interactions with emergency rooms, uh, law enforcement, if they have access to 11 um, or any other crisis intervention hotline, um, suicide hotlines. Um, it also considers um, if they are engaging in any risky activities, um, so um, drugs or sex trafficking, if they've been beat up um, or if they've, you know, wanted to harm someone else or themselves. Um, so we look at those things in the risk section. Um, the next section is socialization and uh, daily functioning. So in, um, in the socialization realm of, of this section, we are looking at how someone is able to maintain relationships. So um, do they think that you know, people owe them money or that they owe people money? Um, how um, their, if their homelessness may be, have been brought about um, by the breakdown of a relationship, whether that it was, you know, like family members or whether it was an abusive relationship. Um, also in this section, we look at whether or not someone is able to take care of themselves. Um, specifically with the families, it asks uh, questions about children um, who may have been um, asked to oversee other siblings um, and things like that. Um, and then our, our last section is wellness. Um, in the wellness section, we are actually looking at someone's physical, uh, mental, and substance abuse history. Um, there is a score for trimorbidity um, in this section also, so that they, they will get a point if there is um, a, a physical, mental, and substance abuse. Um, so we look at those things as kind of collectively um, causing someone to be at a higher vulnerability rate. Um, and then once they have that score, um, the case manager will kind of uh, start to work in, work towards one of the, the, home, the homeless interventions um, into getting that person permanently housed. Um, Amanda, I see a, the poll up. Is it just on my end? Oh, I don't think we're quite ready for the poll yet. I mean, I might have bumped something. <laughs> no, we're trying to add the second poll and it's not showing as live. So we'll, we'll figure that out. Oh, okay. Um, so, so just a couple, just one thing, Jonna, uh, two things. One, um, I wanted to make a note for CCYS. Um, Janelle is um, back at going places. And so okay. um, if someone in that age range needs services, Janelle is available. And then two, um, CCYS has updated everything on their website. So I just wanted to put that out there because I know there's an increase of clients in that 16 to 24 age range. So we want to make sure that they can get served and be served well. Okay. And Thank Roderick, you. did you have your hand up? Okay. Um, what Amanda is showing you right now is our overall coordinated entry data. So we started, um, we revamped coordinated entry in May of 2018. Um, so since then we have uh, enrolled 960 people um, in coordinated entry. 
Um, of those 960 people, um, 541 people, uh, I'm sorry, heads of households were assessed. Um, so when there is a family, only the, the head of household would be assessed. So there is some, some skewed uh, numbers there um, as far as the, from the total persons to the heads of households. Um, so as a COC, through all of our programs um, and coordinated entry, we have exited 495 people into uh, permanent housing. Um, so that would be uh, permanent supportive housing, Section 8 vouchers, um, people who are able to self-resolve, I'm sorry, to, to um, enroll into a um, affordable unit, affordable housing unit, um, and then any other um, housing intervention that would be considered permanent housing. Um, and 133 people um, who were enrolled in coordinated entry um, were chronically homeless. So those are heads of households who have been homeless for 365 days or more in the last three years. Um, and the way that that breaks down uh, in the VI SPDATS is that, um, as you can see, 54% of uh, individuals who were assessed um, were recommended for permanent supportive housing um, or some other long-term uh, rental, uh, they, they needed some other long-term rental subsidy as well as intensive case management. Um, and we know that in our community, there is a great lack um, for those resources. 34% uh, were recommended for a uh, rapid rehousing, um, which meant that there may have been a lesser term, lesser amount of time that they were homeless. Um, and they may have been able to, to um, sustain permanent housing with just rental, sub, the small rental subsidy. And then of course, 14% were able to uh, self-resolve. Uh, for our families, um, which is comparable, 57% um, were recommended for a permanent supportive housing uh, intervention. 39% were recommended for a rapid rehousing uh, intervention, and then only 4% are, of our families are able to self-resolve without any type of uh, rental assistance. And um, for our youth, we're seeing that 45% of our youth um, needed long-term housing interventions, um, as well as intensive support services, and 55% needed some limited housing interventions with uh, moderate service provisions, um, just meaning that they would need some case management to help them work through um, some things. And then 0% were able to, to self-resolve with no services. Um, and that data is actually up on our website um, under our coordinated entry. We review this um, information through our coordinated entry committee. Um, that committee will meet again in January um, we are looking to kind of do some upgrades to our coordinated entry, um, a, a coordinated entry system. Um, and as soon as we roll that out in January, we'll be, our committee will be looking at how that works um, and getting feedback from uh, the users as to how we can um, better serve those people, serve our clients through that system. I guess I can take any questions. Have I missed anything, Amanda? So looking in the chat, um, uh, one question is whether or not there's a wait list for family housing. Um, yes, so the, the way that um, coordinated entry works is that we have case conferencing. So we have case conferencing at the individual, I'm sorry, for the PSH level, the veteran level, youth and for families. Um, so collectively there is um, a list of prioritization. So um, as someone scores and um, works through getting el their eligibility documentation um, uploaded into our HMIS system, um, people will um, be placed into housing as soon as it's available from that list. So yes, we do have a, a list for all housing. LaShawn, this as, is Yes. And you, uh, if you're referring to what was in the chat about our wait list, is that what you were talking about, LaShawn? Is, were we talking about for emergency housing or for permanent housing? Thank <laughs> you. 
I don't know who asked that question. I think it was, uh, LaShawn said something about a wait list and you responded to her, Jonna, and I thought it might be referring to what's in the chat, which are ways um, a little bit different than what you were talking about. Yes, Marie, if you wanna, if they're looking for emergency, if that question was for, my question, my answer was for permanent housing. So right. Marie, you want to give them the answer yeah. for emergency shelter? Well, just in case people are wondering about HOPE's wait list, it's our uh, wait list hotline, if you will. Uh, what we do, what we've been talking about is diversion. When people call in, we get this, uh, it's not a live number where people are answering that phone. We ask for their name and number. And within 24 hours, we're calling them back and just trying to get more information. We do a little bit of a risk assessment. And it's like you were talking about earlier, you want to triage, you know, who is the most at, who's the highest risk. And once we find out that information, it's not a first come first serve, it's who's a, in the highest risk and needs the uh, shelter uh, most. And then we, we will fill our beds via that way. And we do try and divert. Uh, again, I'm not gonna repeat what was said earlier, but uh, that's the purpose of that wait list. If you use that number or give that number out, please encourage people to ensure their voice mailbox is set up or that the voice mailbox is not full. Uh, sadly, a lot of times we keep trying and calling and calling and can't get through because the voice mailbox isn't set up or, or it's full. So encourage that if you can. Thank you. So uh, my friend Gina with the G had a question and she, her question is based around youth and children. Um, and Gina, I will say we had a meeting on Monday, um, UPHS, CCYS, Amanda, and uh, with the COC and another provider. And so the next meeting, we will definitely be incorporating some data about youth and children in Tallahassee. All right, that's what we got. All righty, I guess we're ready to move on. LaShawn, I'm not, we can just skip the next poll if it's. Yeah, we're actually running behind, a little behind on time. So to catch us back up, I think that'll be a good thing. Okay. And so the next part um, we'll cover is our um, homeless management information system. And there's just a few things that our HMIS team is going to mention on ways to use HMIS that really are ways to help an individual in a housing crisis guys take it away. Absolutely. Hi everyone, my name is Eric Layton. I'm the uh, Data and Training Director with the COC. Uh, joining me today is our Data and Training uh, Support Specialist, Broderick Seabrooks. We're going to tell you a little bit about what HMIS is, some of the benefits of HMIS, how HMIS is used, and that kind of thing. I'm going to go ahead and take a moment to share my screen here. And hopefully everyone will be able to see this. So what we have here is kind of a representation of what HMIS is. And I know we've got some folks on the call today who already use HMIS. A lot of people who, for some of you, this is gonna be your first time kind of seeing HMIS. So to tell you a little bit about what HMIS is, I'm gonna turn this over to our data and training support specialist, Roderick Seabrooks. Hello, everybody. My name is Broderick Seabrooks. I'm gonna give you some information about HMIS. Okay, so HMIS is um, known as Homeless Management Information System, which is a secure web-based database that gives um, us access to track the clients being served by our providers. Um, HMIS is a data collection that gives us a better understanding of our clients' needs. Um, HMIS also acts as a a case management tool by allowing clients the services provided and their progress to be monitored. HMIS generates data used to create um, various reports for our providers to see how accurately they are assisting our clients. These reports are provided to City of Tallahassee, Leon County, Hood, etc. HMIS generates data used for various grants and funding competitions such as HUD's Continuum of Care competition. 
And Brody, why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, data quality that uh, we work with each of our providers on? Um, we work closely with some of our, um, well, with all of our um, providers and we run a report to, um, to show them where they are and the consistency that they are, con that they are providing our, um, our, our clients. And we give them, uh, that report gives them a score at the end of the report that's run um, and shows them exactly where some discrepancies are in the, um, the things that they're putting in for our clients, like such as social security numbers, um, that's probably missing some um, things on the assessment and we can be able to show them exactly, hey, this is where the discrepancy is and for them to be able to go in and create and correct those um, errors and they can get a better score when they go in and do that. Absolutely. Thank you, Brody. Go ahead. All righty. So here is an inside look of what HMIS looks like. This is um, this is one of our test clients, um, Mr. McTest Space. Um, you can see the demographics of the, the client. You have the social security number, you have the name, you have the date of birth, the gender, the race, et cetera. Also, you have um, the households tab where you can see if the client is attached to a family um, by themselves. Um, you have the R ROI tab, which is the release of information uh, for us to be able to um, release the client's information to the other agencies that we um, provide services to. Um, you have the entry and exit tab. Um, there you're able to see exactly where the client is stationed. You have the case managers tab to see exactly who the um, client is, um, is under, who's managing that client's case. Um, you have the plans, like the goals that set by the case manager for the client, and you have the assessment and measurement tool to see exactly where the client is when they're in the program and after they leave the program. Um, you can see right here who uses HMIS. Um, listed below is a few of our agencies that um, we provide services to in the Big Bend region. Um, you see the Ability First, you see Catholic Charities, um, CCY, um, CCYS, CESC, just to name a few. And collectively between some of those participating partners that uh, use our HMIS, those come together to each of those different programs works with different, uh, different programs within those agencies. So all together, we have well over a hundred different homeless and homelessness prevention, housing and services programs that those agencies assist in providing service with. So Brody, thank you, we appreciate that. Uh, one other thing we wanted to mention is the user access requirements. Because of the fact that our HMIS is a secure web-based system, it is, it is entirely online. And because of that, we take security and user privacy and confidentiality, very, very important. Um, so because of that, all participating users of that HMIS system must complete and submit a notarized affidavit of good moral character, as well as being subject to a level two background screening prior to gaining access to that system. And we do have those screenings completed every so often just to make sure everything is kept up, kept current in the system uh, in order to continue that access. So another item that we wanted to talk to you about today is some of the benefits of HMIS. And some of the primary benefits of that system uh, is one of the biggest is allocation of resources. Utilizing the data within HMIS, we can use this data to quantify the total number of clients that have been served by a program, uh, the success of those clients, the monetary investment for taking care of those clients and providing services. Uh, and using that data, being able to quantify that data in order to put in applications for funding, applications for additional resources, we can justify the need for those services and for those additional resources. As far as uh, sharing sensitive information, because like I've mentioned, this is a secure private system. It is entirely web-based. 
This allows uh, a case manager at one agency to upload case management files or documentation regarding that client and share that information with another agency. So for example, if the client goes to uh, the Carning Center uh, one week, Carning Center uploads some kind of documentation which is supportive in providing uh, service to that client or uh, assisting that client in uh, obtaining housing. The next week they go to another uh, facility or another shelter, that other facility will be able to see that in a secure central environment rather than having to utilize email or other secure uh, venues. Uh, coordinated case management, same concept with that. If a client is working with one agency this week, they go to a different agency the next week, that other agency doesn't have to start from scratch. They'll be able to utilize case notes and case manager documentation from that other agency. So they're not having to start from scratch with the client and frustrating the client by having them repeat their entire life story and situation. That directly impacts the efficiency of services and the speed at which the client is able to receive services and ultimately receive housing. Um, because of the fact that you have this centralized database, the centralized hub where all client information is stored, this can help to avoid duplication of clients and services. So you don't have a case file at the Carney Center that's this thick and a case file for the client over at Ability First or Hope or another facility. You have the ability to share that information centrally. And as far as reporting, I wanted to kind of jump to a whole separate screen as far as reporting and talk to, to you just very briefly about the alphabet soup of reports that we work with every year. Uh, so a couple of examples, the LSA or Longitudinal uh, Systems Anal uh, Analysis, gosh, I can't even say that. So uh, the LSA is a means that uh, we submit the majority of these reports to HUD every year, but the LSA is a report that's produced from our COC's HMIS system. It's submitted annually to HUD, and this provides HUD and the continuum of care with critical information about how people experiencing homelessness are using the system of care and the services that are available in our community. The APR or annual performance review is a means that the C, I almost consider this uh, how we as a COC are graded. This is how we can uh, show metrics as far as uh, what has been done with these clients. What's our success rate in the, with these clients? There's several different metrics that identify the, the, really the success rate of what the COC is doing, what each of the participating partners are doing in order to provide services to these clients. And then the PIT, PIT and HIC. PIT is point in time and the HIC is housing inventory chart. What that is, the PIT is a representation of all homeless clients within our community at one time of the year that represents the total homeless population as of that moment. The HIC is a representation of total housing and total bed count available within the continuum participating agencies. Uh, these are just kind of a handful of the different reports that we utilize. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention as far as those in particular, the, uh, the APR, one of the items that we utilize that are very, very critical in assisting us to know how we're doing with these clients is what's known as the system performance measures. Now, the system performance measures are essentially how we are doing with the clients. What is the client's success rate? How many clients do we have that are first time homeless clients? Um, we're looking for a reduction in that number. So as far as for data, we want to see total number of persons who are entering homelessness for the first time. We want that, that number to go down through the efforts of prevention and diversion services. Uh, number of clients who have entered homelessness, exited homelessness, and then returned to homeless. We're looking for a reduction in that number. Uh, total length of time homeless. We're looking for a reduction in the total duration of time, which assists us in identifying that our average time to provide housing or services to that client has decreased. That's a success for us. Uh, we're looking for an increase to jobs and income. 
in providing these clients the necessary services to obtain employment, to obtain income so that they can live independently. Uh, an increase in the total number of clients who are obtaining and maintaining housing, and then ultimately uh, a reduction in total homelessness. If we can utilize these numbers to really quantify what our clients are doing, how we're providing service, we use these numbers. And again, this information is reported annually to HUD as well as other continuums of care. So we can actually quantify how we're doing with these clients. So that is kind of a nutshell. I understand we're running a little short on time, so I don't want to take up too much time, but does anyone have any questions in regards to our HMIS system or anything else that you'd like to know? Or Amanda, is there anything you'd like to share? Yeah, I just want to mention the link between coordinated entry and HMIS. Um, co the coordinated entry system and how we share all of that assessment information um, with other providers and get them referred, that is all housed within our HMIS system. So um, that is, you know, how it works and how we're able to share information quickly and easily. Um, there's, there's a huge value in that and having the client not have to repeat their story over and over again and having them be further traumatized by experience in that over and over again. Absolutely. Does anyone else have any additional questions, comments, concerns, anything at all in regards to our homeless management information system? Either no one has any questions or I've put everyone to sleep. So either way, I think we're just gonna keep on trucking. So LaShawn, what have you got next for us? So that was awesome. It's, it's very amazing to see it from the back end, very detailed. So thank you uh, very, very much. Um, we are gonna kick it to Taylor Barrow, who um, I work with a lot. Love uh, me some Taylor, UPHS loves Taylor. And Taylor's just gonna kind of facilitate a, a couple of questions for us to discuss. Um, the last time we really didn't get a chance to do much discussion. Um, so I will kick it to Taylor. Taylor, we do have a chat in the, in the um, a question in the chat from Nancy. Awesome. Um, hey, everybody. So yeah, it looks like we have so many experts in the room too and community members. Uh, so this is very exciting to get to ask some questions. Um, let's see. So Nancy says, I'm still unclear on where the client begins the process with COC or with a provider, for instance, an adult with a mental health issue uh, who needs housing. I can I can answer that. This is Jonna. Um, hey, Taylor, it's good to see you. Um, so if someone had a mental health issue, they could either call um, Ability First or they could go to um, Ability First and receive that assessment. They would then work with a case manager who would help them work through um, getting into um, housing. Awesome, thank you. Um, and now we just wanna hear, you know, we heard about the systems, but we wanna hear your experiences of helping people access the homeless management system and the systems we have in place. So if you wanna either raise your hand or put in the chat that you wanna speak and then, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Take it away. Um, hey, my name is Amy Rogers and I um, run a project called the Backpack Project and I just do street outreach. My question is, um, sorry, I need to take some breaths. Um, my question is, when I run into people who, I will give you an example, Donald who is living on the corner of Tennessee Street in Monroe at the old um, gas station, the abandoned gas station, where do I direct him? If he wants help and he's been living there for however long, I actually don't know if he wants help, but let's say he wants help. Where do I direct him? Or who do I call to say, hey, go meet Donald. He lives at the gas station and maybe somebody who is an actual social worker and not just a mom who created a backpack project, um, that he could get some real help. 
So um, what do I do? Where do I direct people? Besides the Kearney Center, because I hear a lot of people do not want to go there. So what is my next, what's my next step to help people get the housing that they need or shelter for the night? Um, so, so Donald is uh, working, uh, well, outreach does uh, go, to, go to see uh, clients out. Um, so okay. they would be offered an assessment through outreach. Um, if you needed to get hooked up with outreach, then you're welcome to give me a call. Um, yes. At, at, you're welcome to give me a call. Um, I'll put my number in the chat um, and I will coordinate outreach um, for any client who is unsheltered. Okay, do you already know Donald? Yes. Okay. Um, then that's wonderful news. And is there, am I allowed to ask whether he is accepting help or is he happy where he is at the moment? Um, you're, you're welcome to give me a call offline. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. um, and then I'll also add that, you know, it's, so important to have community folks out there doing outreach like the Backpack Project, you know, and the COC and everybody can't be in all places all the time. And so that constant message of there's someone here, um, we have the same message of there's more in our community. So you can absolutely talk about housing and that availability and, and even ask Donald, you know, if he's interested in housing or not to be able to keep that conversation going so that when he does talk to COC, it's just constant positive message of um, there's more whenever you're ready for it. Awesome. I think my um, I think I'm just coming from a place of um, I just want to be able to before I ask him if he wants housing, I want to be able to have what he needs for that to happen. All the resources and the phone number of the woman who I was just talking to, who unfortunately I'm on my phone. So I only see three other people besides me. So I don't even actually know who is answering me. Um, but Taylor, I'm sure you could help me with that. Um, but I would love to have my own um, you know, resources in my purse to be able to just call and send somebody to go and take care of um, whoever it is that I'm trying to lend a hand to as well. Yeah, Amy, thank you for your comments and thank you for your work. Um, oh, thank you for your work. We um, often find out about people that we didn't know about through phone calls and through experiences like you experience every day with people. And so it's okay. totally appropriate to just call the Continuum of Care office and say, hey, I run into somebody at this location. Can you guys follow up? And then Jonna Coleman, who is speaking, um, she coordinates outreach. And so she'll make sure the, the more appropriate outreach person goes to meet with that person based on what we know about them. Okay, this is great. I've been doing this too long to not have the information like this that I need. So I appreciate it. Very thankful for the Backpack Project. Amazing mm, Thank job. you. Thanks for inviting me, you guys. So yeah, uh, we'd like to hear more of folks' experiences um, accessing the system. David has a good point in the chat. David, do you wanna say that um, out loud? Go for it, David, take it away. I've been uh, working to distribute food for about six months to people who have been moved into hotel accommodations from the Kearney Center. And because we are seeing people who've been in the system for over a year, we're having a hard time kind of placing what holds them back from moving into permanent housing of any sort. And so I was just looking for some some feedback on, you know, what what we might can do to assist those folks who don't seem to be progressing out of the shelter type housing. Jonna, does that um, speak to you? I feel like you probably have some awesome things to say to that. I didn't know if Amanda wanted. Oh, Jonna, we're having trouble hearing you. You're breaking up. Um, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I wanted to actually give the Carney Center a chance to answer. 
Um, do we have sure. somebody with the Carney Center on the phone who can talk about the um, major barriers uh, to accessing housing for those emergency shelter residents? I'm scrolling through. I don't know if I see someone from the Kearney Center, but yeah, I don't either. Um, I'll, I'll speak to a little bit to what we know is an issue right now. Um, there's a, quite a big push to get people into permanent housing now. You, many of you may have heard that we need to kind of lower the census at our emergency shelters. One, because it's the right thing to do and people need permanent housing. Two, because it's no longer safe because of the pandemic to have people in um, congregate areas like that. Um, but the biggest thing right now is identifying landlords that are willing to take people who um, may have a felony in their background or may have former evictions. So um, that is the work that we're ramping up now. We have some support with the city of Tallahassee to um, pay for a position that engages landlords and explains some of the um, benefits and supports that come with somebody from our system because they're tied to an agency. Um, but that is the biggest thing we need right now is um, landlords to come in closer and be willing to be educated and, and you know work with our people who need housing um, and work with the agencies when something doesn't go quite right and puts them in different housing. It looks like Sylvia has some more to add to that too. Well, I just need to elaborate on that a little bit. Um... So the landlords that, um, you know, when, when, when we're working with an individual and they approach a landlord, the, a landlord's gonna look at usually four things, um, criminal background, employment background, credit history, and eviction history, and, and possibly also leasing history, you know. Um, and so when we say we're looking for landlords, um, you know, landlords are allowed to have tenant screening criteria as long as they're uh, not in violation of people's civil rights. So they can, you know, they can set um, pretty high screening criteria. And, and unfortunately what happens is, is it, can just, it can just box people out. And, and we have seen people um, submit um, repeated, uh, payments to apply for an apartment because a lot of times there's a an administrative fee associated with applying for an apartment only to find out you know that the screening criteria is going to exclude them so when we say we're looking for landlords you know we're looking for landlords who who either maintain a lower set of screening but still provide safe hygienic well-maintained property or people who will you know, kind of make an exception to their screening criteria because of working in partnership with a case management agency that's going to at least help with the initial placement. And if it's a long term placement like permanent supportive housing, we will work with them. We do something in permanent supportive housing called rehousing. So for every for every new person we get housed each year in permanent supportive housing, we, we, we do about the same number of rehousing activities. And what that involves is is moving somebody to, to protect a, a relationship between the client and the landlord, um, to protect the relationship between us and the landlord, because we desperately need that landlord, and to try to find a better match um, in terms of environment for the individual. Um, so that's enough about that. But there, the, the barriers are very concrete that we're looking for landlords to make some exceptions on credit history, criminal history, eviction history, employment history. Um, thank you. And, you know, it, it's also that it's people that we're working with too. And I, I think a lot of times when we think of systems, um, you know, it's hard to bounce back and forth between people's feelings and then also the systems that we're, we're trying to get them to engage with. And change is scary. And some people, um, you know, it's scary to move from a shelter to a full-time housing and worry that you're going to miss all of this that you've built. So it's really constant positive um, communication about what's out there and, and putting that forward. Um, so we heard about landlords, but you know, now I'd like to hear if there's any other resource or service that might be a gap um, in what you've heard today or even what you've experienced with helping clients or people move through the homeless service system. 
Hey, Taylor, one thing that I just wanted to mention, I apologize. I think I saw a raised hand from a 615 area code caller. Oh, thank you. Go ahead and speak whoever that is. Oh, I see it. I don't know if you're able to speak personal. Oh, they went on mute. Hi, I just, I just got unmuted. This is Holly Bernardo from the Carney Center. I was trying to respond to your question earlier. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. We can hear you. Go ahead. Um, I think one of the things that you're seeing when the, when people ask about why are people not moving out, some of it is all of what Sylvia described as we have to work really hard with landlords, but we also have to work with people who often don't have any income to sustain housing or have significant mental health issues that need really permanent level, permanent supportive housing levels of support. So those are particularly challenging. And the reality is we have a decent number of clients that have significant mental health and physical impairments, and it takes longer to find them housing and income to sustain that housing. And we need access to PH, PSH dollars for those clients or another creative solution. So there isn't just one answer because there's so many different people that have different needs. Permanent supportive housing is a route for some of our clients. Some of our clients can certainly access those rapid rehousing dollars and we've moved a number of clients out that can have employment and kind of get back up on their feet with those services. But it's tricky and complicated and it definitely, we have to look at the different needs each person possesses in that process. Thanks for that, Holly. I, uh, that makes me think of another thing too um, that's needed at the end when somebody is housed. Um, you know, if somebody has been uh, placed through one of those rapid rehousing projects or a permanent supportive housing project, the support on the community side is a big part of why people stay out of homelessness. So if you, um, and people may not share this information with you, but um, if you're you interact with somebody who's just recently kind of gotten out of a housing crisis, reach out, befriend them, have coffee with them, um, do something as a friendly neighbor to help support them in their new housing situation. Um, that alone is helping them expand their social network, which will help them be supported so that they don't have to come to the homeless system of care for their support system exclusively. Um, so that is another opportunity where, um, you know, we have, you know, you and me as an individual person can immediately kind of take some action and engage with people to help support them a bit better. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. Do we have time for one more question or let me know? We do? Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So back to that question before, are there any resources that were um, missing or overlooking right now that, that you can see are needed? Hey, hello. Go for it, Miss Pat. Okay, hi. Um, I just have a question. Um, is, there, is there anyone in Gaston County that I could be connected to that if we if we meet someone that we don't have to call, uh, you know, uh, Leon County, that there, is there anyone in this area, uh, Retina or just anywhere in Gaston County that that is that is that is accessible, that has either has a place or or just someone that's connected, just like you all, with to the um to the help. Is there anyone else to call? Is there anyone? to call an emergency right here in, besides the sheriff's office. Miss Pat, I don't know of anything that's like on call in Gadsden County. Most all of our rural counties don't have anything that's really on call. Um, the only thing that we've offered to our array of services very recently, I don't even know if there's been somebody hired at the provider level, but Big Bend Homeless Coalition will have a rural county outreach person it's not mm -hmm. really um, an emergency type situation. Um, so, but you know, if you're if you reach out to them and we'll help disseminate that person's phone number once they get in place, 
they okay. can follow up and at least talk to the person over the phone, hopefully find out some more information, do what they can via the phone, um, and then make you know a time to kind of go out and kind of see what's going on and get them connected to other services if possible. Okay, thank you. I was gonna say we call you Miss Pat. That's what we do, right? <laughs> no, <I don't. laughs> yeah, you're you're the rescuer in Gadsden County. <laughs> and then I'm gonna yes. call you. <laughs> so we are at 325. Do we wanna talk about next steps? <laughs> Amanda. Sorry guys, I was multitasking, trying to answer the chat too. Oh, okay. So yeah, so our next steps, um, I feel like this is a really good segue because we've started to talk in this conversation about what are some of our, what's our own personal responsibility with regard to addressing homelessness, but there's other people and entities responsibilities too. And it's really imp important to know what part we kind of fit into. So our next conversation is going to be December 9th, I believe. And um, we're going to be talking about all of the different players in the system of care. And then we're actually going to um, work at that point to have anybody who's on that call sign up to kind of work on something. It can be a personal goal that you engage people experiencing homelessness and try to ask them a few questions about themselves, get to know them more, or it could be you're helping with some landlord initiatives or you're helping um, through what Amy mentioned earlier, doing backpack projects, something like that, that helps us identify people. Um, we need people in all aspects of care for our people. And um, so there is a place for you. There's more than one place for you. Um, we have a, a seat. Um, as part of the solution at our table with your name on it. And if you are having trouble kind of figuring out what you do as a person and what you're going to do, um, this last conversation will help sure that up for you and help you find the place where you fit in and give you access to all of the other entities and components that you should have in your tool belt if you're going to kind of tackle this with us. And the more people that we have that are well-versed in the situation and are trauma-informed, the better results we're gonna have. And the more likely we will reach our goals of ending homelessness here locally. Um, there's no reason that the city of Tallahassee needs to have a homeless issue. Um, we are very capable and a very caring community. Um, so there, is, there are ways for us to kind of address this together do the parts that we do individually and as agencies well, um, but it takes all of us kind of pushing in the same direction. Um, we'll talk about um, roles for faith partners, governments, um, the justice system, schools, healthcare system. Um, there's, there are spots for absolutely everyone because homelessness affects everyone. Um, we'll be sending you guys some notifications about how to register for that one, but it'll be via Zoom too. Um, and it'll include some more information from some of the other partners about how they kind of participate in the system now. Um, so you'll be hearing from some other major partners of ours as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so these conversations are always good and the time seems to go by really, really fast. Um, Stanley, I do see your question. I'm going to put you in an email connect with Amanda about people who are currently getting put out because there is some funds and some other resources that they have. And it'll be good for the two of you co to connect, um, being that you're running the help program. So I'll email you all as soon as this is over, Stanley. So we want to thank you all very much. Um, again, this is amazing information. Um, if you need contact information for Amanda or anyone on her team, feel free to reach out um, to me and I'll be happy to get that to you. Um, this is being recorded, so it'll be posted on our website uh, probably tomorrow, as well as our UPHS YouTube channel. And I will be sending a reminder for our December meeting so that you all can go ahead and get that on the calendar. Thank you for your time today and you all have a great evening.
You too. Thank you.